morning. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're coming, it's coming through? Great. Uh, a warm welcome, like Paul said, to Catalyst, and it's a joy for us to be together, isn't it, this first session. We're going to be in Psalm 23 for these three morning sessions, but first of all, before we turn to Psalm 23, and before we read that, uh, I'd like you to turn to Exodus, please, Exodus chapter 3, and I'm going to read the first 15 verses, and then we'll go, then we'll go to Psalm 23. So turn to Exodus. Exodus chapter 3 and reading, reading from verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Let's turn to Psalm 23. You might want to keep at least a finger in Exodus. I'll refer back to it a couple of points, but let's Hear this beautiful psalm together. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I, I have a theory about who the most unruly sheep is on a Sunday. 
Now, there are lots of candidates, aren't there? I don't know your church the way I know mine, but I know there are candidates in your church for the most unruly sheep. Uh, there is the difficult sheep, the annoying sheep, the willfully unrepentant sheep. But I think on a Sunday, no one is as agitated as this sheep, the most unruled sheep, the shepherd. Isn't that true? So your minister's WhatsApp group is where you take your shepherd's pulse on a Sunday evening. I can assure you your minister is in one. And the text that he sends on a Sunday night, that's how you take your minister's temperature. It's what they all do Sunday evenings. They text each other, how was today for you? Nightmare. Awful. It's true, isn't it, ministers, what we're doing Sunday evenings? We know our own hearts, don't we? We stand at the front. Welcome to church, everybody. Why are the welcome team doing that again at the back as you're smiling and beaming to the congregation? We've talked about this. They're doing it again. Not, not him again. Where is everybody? And then on top of all those sort of little irritations, you pile on all the more substantial things, don't you? Conflict, budgets, building projects, your own family and their needs. Somehow as, uh, as fellowships, we survived COVID, didn't we? But many of us are knackered after COVID. We're, 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 we survived it, but we're carrying the scars of it in some way, aren't we? And our, our brothers in the Church of England, many of you here today visiting, we know that our brothers and sisters in the Church of England have been plunged into a very deep dark valley at the minute, haven't they? And many shepherds feel like they're living right on the edge all the time. Isn't that true? I saw somebody say on Twitter recently, they said this, behind most burnout is not merely overwork and exhaustion, but an open wound and loneliness. Healing will not come by taking a vacation, rather it will come through an excavation of deep-seated unspoken pain. I, I suspect most church families would be astonished to know how lost their shepherds often feel and how lost they feel because of the work and because of the weight of the calling. Uh, if I had to pick one main word for my stage of life, um, I'm married with four children, three teenagers, um, a 10 year old and been in ministry for nearly 20 years. One main word for my stage of life and my stage of ministry, it is bewildered. It's the main feeling. So some of you have read Craig Hamilton's book, uh, I think it's Matthias Media book, Wisdom and Leadership. Craig Hamilton says this, the hardest person you will ever lead is yourself. And you are the most important person that you'll need to learn how to lead. So what I want to do for us over these next three mornings, three sessions, is to take us to Psalm 23 and to let God address us as sheep before we think about being shepherds. So the, 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 the task of being a shepherd, that's for the other speakers. That's what they're going, going to do for us. My task is this. The first calling of the Christian minister is simply to be a Christian. The first duty of the shepherd is to be a sheep. Uh, some of you flew down to get here. It's what they always say on the flights, isn't it? The flight attendant says, before helping anybody else, put on your own mask. And that's what I want to do in these three sessions for us as shepherds to put on our own mask before assisting others. And I want us to look at this most famous of Psalms. And I have a simple aim for our time together in these sessions. And the simple aim is this, it's to show us who the Lord Jesus is for us as sheep. But what is Jesus like to you this morning? Who is he to you? Three sessions. Number one, Jesus is sufficient for you. Number two, tomorrow morning, Jesus is present with you. And number three, Jesus is lavish to you. you know, all from this Psalm, Psalm 23. Everybody loves Psalm 23, right? But I, I want to rescue this Psalm from your funeral services. Uh, in Charles Spurgeon's Treasury of David, if, if you work through that, you read, you get Spurgeon on the psalm, and then he has this extra section of 
what he calls explanatory notes and quaint sayings. So this isn't Spurgeon, but this is somebody that he's gleaned uh, uh, in his treasury of David. Listen to this. The 23rd Psalm is the nightingale of the Psalms. It is small, singing shyly out of obscurity, but oh, it has filled the air of the world with melodious joy, greater than the heart can conceive. Blessed be the day on which that Psalm was born. This Psalm has charmed more griefs to rest than all the philosophy of the world. It has sent to their dungeon more delinquent thoughts, more black doubts, more thieving sorrows than there are sands on the seashore. This psalm has comforted the noble host of the poor. It has sung courage to the army of the disappointed. It has poured balm and consolation into the heart of the sick. It has poured consolation into widows in their griefs and orphans in their loneliness. Dying soldiers have died easier as this psalm was read to them. Ghastly hospitals have been illuminated. This psalm has visited the prisoner and broken his change. It has made the dying Christian slave freer than his master. Nor is this psalm's work done. It will go on singing to your children and my children and to their children through all the generations of time, nor will it fold its wings until the last pilgrim is safe and time is ended. And then it shall fly back to the bosom of God from where it came. And even then it will continue to sound, mingled with, with all those sounds of celestial joy which make heaven musical forever. Isn't that beautiful? I want to make an appeal to you as we do this, as we go through Psalm 23, I want to make an appeal to you as we do it together, as fellow expositors of Scripture, here's an appeal to slow down in your preaching and to preach smaller portions of text. Now, I know that's controversial. I know it can be fraught with problems. I know a congregation needs variety in its diet. You don't want to do it all the time and so on and so on. But on the whole, I want to say that the older we get, the harder it should be to just move quickly through big portions of Scripture in our teaching. You remember Gregory the Great's famous words uh, commenting on Job? Scripture is like a river, broad and deep, shallow enough here for the lamb to go wading, but deep enough there for the elephant to swim. And I don't think we're taking many elephants for a swim, are we often, in our preaching? You might have to preach Psalm 23 in one go at a funeral, but you shouldn't want to. Alec Mateer says, as you look at it, if you're using the ESV, if you look at it in front of you, Alec Mateer says there are three sections to the psalm, verses 1 to 3, the sheep and the shepherd, verse 4, the traveler and the companion, and verses 5 and 6, the guest and the host. Like I said, the ESV has those three sections laid out. I want to suggest you could do three sermons, one on each section. That's what we did in, in Trinity and Aberdeen, three sermons on each of the sections. Now, some people say, no, there are only two main images in the, in the psalm. There is the shepherd, verses 1 to 4, and there is the host, verses 5 and 6. It's really clear, isn't it? Verse 4 definitely is still part of the shepherding imagery because you have the staff and the rod and so on. But here's what Alec Mateer spots. Mateer says there are three great confessions of faith in the psalm. Three great confessions. Did you spot them? Did you hear them as we read it? Verse 1, I shall not want. Verse 4, I will fear no evil. And verse 6, I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Two things I will not do, one thing I will do. And here's the point. Each one of those, each one of those beautiful, confident confessions of faith in the Lord, each one has a slightly different reason for the confession. Why shall I not want, verse 1, because the Lord is my shepherd? Why will I fear no evil? Because you are with me. Why will I dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Because you are a host who welcomes me and leads me there. Just put your eyes on the text. Notice what Notice what holds all three of those 
confessions together. What, what's the glue, the bone structure? There is a spine that runs all the way through Psalm 23, and it's the he and me relationship, isn't it? That that's the glue, the bond between the Lord and me. And that's what I want us all to have from these sessions. Look at it all the way through. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me, he leads me, he restores my, he leads me. But then notice in verse four, notice how it changes, not just he and me, but now it becomes you and me. You see what King David has done? Verses one to three, he has pulled you in. Let, let me tell you about the shepherd. Let me tell you about my shepherd. But now in verse four, it's as if, it's as if once he started talking about him, it's as if he just simply has to start talking to him directly. I will fear no evil, not because he is with me, but because you are with me. And, and he just stays with the shepherd right to the end, doesn't it? It's you, you, you all the way to the end. It's profoundly beautiful. It's personal. It's, it's precious. It's one of the key ways, isn't it, that you know shepherds have stopped being sheep is when they only say he to God, not you. So there's, there, there's our three sessions, the shepherd, the companion, the host, three sessions. And each time in each section, I think, surprise, surprise, there are three points within each section. So for today, verses one to three, here are three things to know about the shepherd. Number one, who he is. Number two, what he provides. And number three, where he leads. Who he is, verse one. What he provides, verse 2, and the first line of verse 3, and where he leads the rest of verse 3. And friends, in my campaign for more depth in our preaching, you won't, be, you won't be surprised to hear me say that actually this morning we're only going to do the first one, not even all three uh, in the first section. I'm going to give a few brief comments on the other two points, but I want us to reflect on the first five words, the Lord is my shepherd. I wonder if you'd agree with me that I think we move so quickly to the imagery of the psalm, sheep and pastures, water, valley, the poetry of the valley of the shadow of death. That's where we're drawn to straight away. And we move there so quickly that we don't pause at the stunning opening of the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is. It's one thing to have a shepherd, isn't it? That's great. That's good. But actually, everybody has shepherds. We all have shepherds. We're all following someone. We're following something. We're relying on someone or something else all the time to keep us safe and protect us and comfort us. We have a hundred different shepherds all the time. But to be told that the Lord, He, that, that one, the Lord is my shepherd. Friends, that is staggering. You, you, you see in front of you, don't you, the uppercase letters. This is David calling God by his first name, Yahweh. It's God's covenant name. It's exactly what we read in Exodus chapter 3. Moses asks God at the burning bush, who shall I tell your people in Egypt has sent me to them? What is your name? I am who I am, the Lord. I want to say to you today, friends, that whoever you are, I know many of you, but don't know all of you, and whoever you are and whatever you've brought with you today, however you're feeling about your ministry, I want to say to you that the God, the God in the burning bush, the, the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers, the God who is and was and always will be, that that one is your shepherd that that one shepherds you. Friends, there is nothing better, nothing better than that. And I want us just to linger here, to linger on that. Peter Craigie in his commentary on the Psalms, uh, the Word Biblical Commentary series, he says, Psalm 23, when D David says, the Lord is my shepherd, that's a loaded metaphor. It's not just a metaphor, it's a loaded metaphor. It's not just a picture, it's a picture with a history. It's got a backstory. And the fact is that the divine name, who God is, is tied very closely to shepherding. 
in the biblical narrative. Did, did you notice the opening verse of Exodus chapter 3? What was Moses doing when God called him, when God appears to him in the burning bush? Keeping the flock of his father-in-law. Moses was a shepherd. And just like the Lord Jesus takes fishermen who catch fish to become men who catch men, so God takes Moses who shepherds sheep and makes him shepherd people. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 11. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses, his servant. Where is he who brought up out of the sea the shepherd of his flock? Moses is the shepherd of God's flock. But more than that, Psalm 77, verse 20, God is the one who is the true shepherd. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Psalm 78, verse 52, then he led forth his people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. Do you see the, the visual image? If you were to look at the people fleeing Egypt, if you were to see them passing through the waters of the sea, to see the people moving through the desert with Pharaoh pursuing them and God leading them, what would you paint? The Psalms say you would paint a chief shepherd leading his sheep to safety using under shepherds in Moses and Aaron. And so when Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, we're meant to have that picture in our minds. The shepherd who will lead us out of slavery and lead us to safety by redeeming us is none other than the Lord. It's one thing, friends, to have a shepherd, but it is an utterly staggering thing to have as a shepherd, I am who I am. Well, the beauty of it. So I want to try and show you this theologically, why it's so beautiful. Then I want us to look, we're gonna look at the illustration in Exodus chapter three that God gives to Moses of what the name means. And then if we've time, I want to apply it to us at the end, three applications to us as sheep and shepherds. Here is the doctrine of God you haven't ever yet been taught in seminary, shepherdology. This is the missing aspect. Commentators say that the divine name in Exodus, it means three things. Okay, we're thinking about I am who I am. Phil Riken in his commentary in Exodus, he says this, it means three things. Number one, God is mysterious. Number two, God is immutable and unchangeable. And number three, God is self-existent. Just think about those with me. Number one, God is mysterious. The Lord is my shepherd. Riken says this, by giving us this name, God lets us know who he is. But God's name is so hard to understand. I mean, what does it actually mean? I, I am who I am. It is so hard to understand. It is so inscrutable that it forces us to admit there are some things about God we will never understand. Every single time you preach Psalm 23 at a, at a funeral, you are saying to people, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There, there are some things he does you cannot understand. Brothers and sisters, you do not have a shepherd who is merely, and we think of God like this, don't we? Merely a bigger, vision, a bigger version of you, shepherd. No, you have a mysterious shepherd. Have you ever noticed in Psalm 23, the end of verse three, we're going to look at this tomorrow morning. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his, his name's sake. Where do those paths of righteousness lead? The valley of the shadow of death. Or, or, or look at verse six. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. If you're using the ESV, there's a little footnote down to the bottom. That Hebrew particle surely could be on, only. Only goodness and mercy shall follow me. Now, think about David's life. We've just been doing it in 2 Samuel in church. It is utter carnage, bloodshed, murder, the, the, the disintegration of the royal, the royal household. Think about your life, my life. What, 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 what is behind you? five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years ago, only 
goodness and mercy following you? Number two, God is unchangeable. God is unchangeable, not just mysterious, he is unchangeable. The, the divine name is in the present tense of the Hebrew verb to be, I am who I am. God has no past, no future, only an eternal present, if that's not contradictory, which it is. L listen to Francis Turretin. True eternity, so this is describing God's being, true eternity excludes succession no less than end. Okay, now, when a child begins to learn about what eternity is, they're trying to wrap their head around the fact that time goes on and on and on and doesn't come to an end. That's what we think eternity is. It, it, true eternity excludes end. Yes, says Turretin, but true eternity ex excludes succession no less than end. True eternity ought to be conceived as a standing, not a flowing now. Okay, so time has flowed since we got here this morning. It hasn't just stood. But for God, time, eternity, eternity ought to be conceived as a standing, not a flowing now. The reason is, Turretin says, because nothing flows away with time from the life of God as it does from ours. Nothing flows away from the life of God as it does from ours. Listen to this. God has every moment at once, whatever we have dividedly by succession of time. God has every moment at once, whatever we have dividedly by succession of time. Isn't it stunning, friends? All of world history is present to God in a single moment. Can you, can you fathom it? All of world history is present to God in a single moment. So you lie awake at 5 a.m. wondering what is going to happen today. That meeting, that project, that venture, where am I going to find the money for this? How am I going to sort out that problem? And all of world history is present to God in that moment. Does he look stressed to you about the future, worried about what's coming? All of history is present to the ever blessed eternal I am. God is mysterious. God is unchangeable. Number three, here's where I want to spend a bit more time. God is self-existent. I am who I am. See, think about your own life. When you, you came to be, when I came to be, we owed the origin of our life to our parents, didn't we? We owed it to people who came before us, and we owe the maintenance of our lives to the resources of the natural world all around us. We have never been able just to say, I am, or even to say, I will be, because the very essence of being a human being is to be a dependent creature, isn't it? But God is revealing to Moses that this name, his name, the Lord, means that none of those things that are true about us are true of him. Matthew Henry, the greatest and best man in the world, must say, by the grace of God, I am what I am. But God alone says absolutely, I am who I am. God is who he is simply by virtue of being himself. His existence is from himself. It is for himself. There is nothing about him that is derived in any way from anybody else. God is absolutely self-sufficient, self-existent. And he is your shepherd. Your shepherd. Just, just think about the illustration in Exodus chapter 3. You never have to illustrate this. It's there for you in the text, isn't it? The burning bush. What does the bush mean? What's the point of it? It's, it's true, of course, isn't it, that fire symbolizes the holiness of God? But the main point of the bush burning with fire, yet not being consumed by fire, is precisely to illustrate God's self-existent nature, isn't it? Sinclair Ferguson puts it like this, the fire that was in the bush was not dependent on the bush for its energy to burn. It was a most pure fire, a fire that was nothing but fire. 
a fire that was not a compound of other energy sources, but had its energy source in itself. Moses was given a vivid visual aid, wasn't he, to teach him, you're worried about going to speak to Pharaoh? No, I'm teaching you, Moses, teaching you the Westminster Confession, chapter 2. God is the one who has all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself, and is alone and in unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creatures which he has made. Friends, it's so rich, it's worth lingering over it, isn't it? Listen to these words of Alexander McLaren. The fire in the bush, the fire that burns and does not burn out, which has no tendency to destruction in its very energy and is not consumed by its own activity, that fire is surely a symbol of the one being whose being derives its law and its source from itself, who can only say, I am that I am, the law of his nature, the foundation of his being, the only conditions of his existence, being enclosed within the limits of his own nature. You and I have to say, I am that which I have become, or I am that which I was born, or I am that which circumstances have made me. He says, I am that I am. All other creatures are links. This is the staple from which they all hang. All other being is derived and therefore limited and changeful. His being is underived, absolute, self-dependent, and therefore it is unalterable forevermore. Because we live, we die. In living, the process is going on of which death is the end, but God lives forevermore. He is a flame that does not burn out. Therefore, his resources are inexhaustible. His power is unwearied. He needs no rest for recuperation of wasted energy. His gifts diminish not the store which he has to bestow. He gives and gives and gives, and he is none the poorer. He works and he is never weary. He operates unspent. He loves and he loves forever. And through the ages, the fire burns on and on, unconsumed and undecayed. Brothers and sisters this morning, the one who shepherds you neither needs you nor needs to be shepherded himself as he gives himself to shepherd you. He shepherds you from his eternally undiminished fullness, and he is never the poorer for it. Just look at the text again, Psalm 23, verses 1 to 3. Look how needy David is. He's portraying himself as sheep-like, isn't he? In all the things that he needs, he needs food, rest, water, guidance, shelter, comfort, housing. He needs helping, saving, protection. You name it, David needs it. And, And here's the question Psalm 23 asks. Can we see who it is that gives to David what he needs? It is the God who needs nothing and no one. The the one who says to his people, I am. Before you were, I was. And after you are no more, I will be. I am the first. I am the last. I am a God outside time, before time began. In this psalm, friends, David is going to come alongside us as we read it. He's going to put his strong shepherd crook around our shoulder and pull us in so that we can hear him tell us, The God of heaven can meet your every need precisely because he is the one who has no need of anything himself. I think this is where the next phrase in the the psalm, I shall not want, it's where it receives all its, its meaning, isn't it? I shall not want. See, despite my best intentions, my most fervent wishes, I am not the kind of father who's ever able to leave my children in in the position of them saying every day for the rest of their lives, I shall not want. I can't do that for them. I might love them very much. I pray for them always. I long for their best, but I am a finite, sinful man with limited resources on every hand. I cannot supply all that they need as I shepherd them through this life. But, But God is not like that, is He? He's not like that with us. It's one thing to have a shepherd, but a staggering thing to have as a shepherd, the one who is strength itself, who never tires, who never slumbers, who never needs protection. 
Do you know John Mason's hymn, How Shall I Sing That Majesty? How great a being, Lord, is thine, which doth all beings keep. Thy knowledge is the only line to sound so vast a deep. Thou art a sea without a shore, a sun without a sphere. Thy time is now and evermore. Thy place is everywhere. Now, now, now he, here is where we touch the wonder of the fact that this one, a God like this, the Lord might ever be described as a shepherd. See, if, if you take the image of Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush, what, what kind of picture of a divine being does self-existent, all self-sufficiency, what kind of picture does it conjure up in your mind? That, that, that doctrine of God, God's aseity, his from himselfness, doesn't it tend to lead to make you think of pictures of strength, of power? One commentator says that all the images that are used for God throughout the Psalter, American commentator, he says, all the images that are used for God, they have a kind of homeland security ring about them. The dominant metaphors for God are shield, high tower, fortress, high place, refuge, rock, stronghold. What, what, what does Jesus say about himself? John's gospel, chapter 8. Do you remember? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. It's, it's an amazing claim, isn't it? He takes the divine name that God revealed to Moses in the burning bush, and he applies it to himself. I am the Lord. But then, two chapters later, what does he tie to the divine name? John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 10, I am the good shepherd. Just like how Exodus ties the self-sufficient one to the identity of a shepherd, so Jesus ties his own self-sufficiency to the identity of being. Well, what would we expect? A high tower, a fortress, a rock to a shepherd. L listen to Martin Luther. All the other names for God sound somewhat too glorious and too majestic, and they bring, as it were, an awe and a fear with them when we hear them uttered. This is the case when Scripture calls God our Lord, King, Creator. This, however, is not the case with the sweet word, shepherd. It brings to the godly when they read it or hear it, it brings, as it were, a confidence a consolation or a security like the word Father. Friends, I hope, you can, I hope you can see new layers of beauty to this simple phrase, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. It, it's a picture to communicate to you that the one at your side has matchless strength and indescribable power, but it is power that he is stooping to lend to your aid that the self-sufficient God is not the self-absorbed God. The self-existent God is not the self-interested God. No, rather, wonder of wonders, the God who is so strong clothes himself in a picture of the closest, most tender care for those who are so weak. All the resources of his infinite fullness he puts at your disposal, the disposal of finite creatures. He is a shepherd. So, as I finish, three applications. Three applications. Let me try and do these quickly. The Lord is my shepherd, so, number one, I shall not want. I shall not want. That's the application in the text, isn't it? Verse one. It's the great confession of faith. The implication is obvious. It's the way to read the flow of it. There's an implicit logical flow. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore I shall not want. Yeah, there's a sign in a shop window that says, if we don't have it, you're better off without it. If we don't have it, you don't need it. That's what David is saying, isn't it? Because I have you, I don't need anything else. I lack for nothing. If I have him, I have everything. He is mine, so I have all that I need. 
A, a better rendering of that second clause in verse 1 is, I shall not lack. That's better, isn't it? Because, of course, we want things all the time. We're always wanting, wanting a, a rest, a, some food, a holiday. But by saying, I shall lack for nothing, it's saying, I, I, I have everything I really, really need because you are mine. And I want to say to us today, friends, very simply, that the extent, the extent to which we are able to say, I lack for nothing, the extent to which you're able to say that from your heart as a deep confession of faith, that is directly proportional to the extent to which you are able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. Not just the shepherd, but my shepherd. Not the shepherd I talk about on a Sunday, but my shepherd. In other words, the extent of my lacking for nothing is dependent on the extent to which I know who he is. Isn't that right? The extent of my lacking for nothing is dependent on the extent to which I know who he is. Brothers and sisters, do you know that? Do you know that? That the one leading you does not need you. He has a store of undiminished fullness. He's happy in himself. He is eternally self-sufficient, and he's, he's yours. And, and what? You think, you think you're lacking something? I mean, what could it possibly be? Number two, number one, I shall not want. Number two, Jesus restores my soul. Jesus restores my soul. I think if you say to David at the end of verse 1, okay, so what does it look like to not lack? What does that actually mean? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That, that last phrase is the heart of it. He restores my soul. What, what you have in verse 2, the lying down, the green pastures, the waters, that is a picture of what restoration feels like. Listen to Harold Kushner. We spend so much of our lives in a man-made environment with its artificial lighting and artificial cooling and healing. There are bright neon signs and color television programs all around us that when we get a day off, we instinctively feel the need to find our way to God's world with its more restful palette. God's world decorated in blues and greens gently calms us gently bathing our eyes with quiet, low-intensity colors. In, in other words, here, here's what it means. When you, when you have that deep emotional sense that the first five, five words of Psalm 23 are true, the Lord is my shepherd. When your heart comes to rest on that, that is how the Lord Jesus, your good shepherd, restores your soul. When you know that He is yours, it's like drinking pure, clean water. It's like lying down. It's like abandoning all your activity and placing yourself in His hands. When you have that deep conviction that because He is your shepherd, you lack nothing, that is what restores your soul. The, the, the green pastures that David is picturing here, you only find them and experience them as you find yourself in relationship with Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Remember what Jesus says in John's Gospel, chapter 10? We find pasture by doing what? By going in and coming out. He is the door. By going into Him and coming out through Him, by coming back to Him again and going out through Him again, coming back to Him again and back to, back to Him again. That This kind of rest comes from an easy familiarity with the presence of the Lord Jesus. When we find green, we find green pastures when in everyday life we are always coming to Him and walking with Him and being led by Him. The, the sheep whose soul is parched, not, not watered by Jesus, and we know this, don't we, as shepherds? The sheep who is not being restored by Jesus every day is a sheep who doesn't think he needs the Lord as his shepherd. Maybe you're a shepherd this morning who has forgotten you are first a sheep. And you think you're the shepherd of your flock. You're not. It's interesting, isn't it? First Peter chapter 5, shepherd your flock that is among you. No, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. 
some of you will have seen that little clip of John Piper talking about Keller after Tim Keller died recently. Piper talked about their most recent exchange. Keller says, in ministry, you have to love the Savior more than service. You have to love the fact that you are saved more than being successful. Rejoice, not that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Brothers and sisters, if this Lord of the burning bush is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and if he is your shepherd, you have all that you need. Is Jesus sufficient for you? Are you communing with him, leaning on him, following him, listening to him, trusting him? Brother shepherd, fellow sheep, Jesus is sufficient for you. He is enough. John Newton, in him I have an offering. In him I have an altar, a temple, a priest, a son, a shield, a savior, a shepherd, a hiding place, a resting place. In him I have food, medicine, riches, honor, wisdom, righteousness, holiness, in short, everything. I want to finish with this, number three, and then we're done. Fellow shepherd, stop over-functioning. Stop over-functioning. Be an under-functioning minister. Be like Paul Levy. <laughs> I, 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 uh, we have three trainees working with us at Trinity Church. One of the trainees said to me, they're coming to the end of two years, one of the trainees said to me the other day out of the blue, you're, you're a workaholic. And I thought, wow. My, my problem is I'm married to a woman who says, I know how to do absolutely nothing better than anybody else she knows. And so I don't know who's right, my wife or the trainee. Um, we, we, know our, we, we know our own hearts, don't we, shepherds? We know what we're like. We know our drive to do more and more and to keep going and to keep going. And what we need to learn to do from this psalm is to apply, learn to apply the doctrine of divine aseity to your ministry. God is not dependent on you. He does not need you. He does not need the success of your church. He does not need your years and years and years of labor. I remember hearing Don Carson say years ago to UCCF staff at the annual staff conference, you need to know God doesn't need UCCF. He doesn't need you. Most of your sins as a shepherd and most of your problems are because you do not believe that the great I am is the shepherd of the sheep. You think you are. It's true, isn't it? Most of my sins in ministry are because I try to make the things that can only be true of God true of me. And most of my sins flow from incorrect shepherdology. Incorrect shepherdology. You know the list of incommunicable attributes, communicable attributes? Jen Wilkin has written a, f a fantastic little book, None Like Him. Uh, she, she lists the incommunicable attributes. God is God is, and only God is, infinite, incomprehensible, self-existent, self-sufficient, eternal, and so on, and so on. And the communicable attributes that we can be, God is, and we can be too, holy, loving, just, good, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, wise, faithful, righteous, truthful. She's hit on the most amazing pastoral insight that the very essence of sin is that we, we are not interested in taking on the communicable attributes. We, we, we're not bothered about being faithful and just and right and true. Instead, we want to be omniscient. We want to be omnipresent. We want to be everywhere, being at all things, to all people at all times. We will take what God has. It's the very essence of Adam and Eve's sin, isn't it? Right at the beginning. No thanks to finitude. No thanks to creatureliness. We'll have what you'll have, God. Thank you. And we'll take it from here. Well, may God help us as we meditate. We're going to keep reflecting over these remaining sessions. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the immense potential that there is over these brief moments together, these days of friendship and fellowship the immense potential most of all of coming back to you and being fed by you and led by you, watered afresh. Lord Jesus, our King, our Savior, our friend, our shepherd, we want to say 
to you in these moments that we love you and that you are everything to us. And so keep us, we pray, all our days at your side, leaning on your arm, listening to your voice, and being nourished by all that you say and do for us, your sheep. In your name we pray and praise you. Amen.